Now to the mountains of Pakistan, where the last survivor of an ill-fated expedition to the top of K2 was airlifted to safety today. 11 other climbers died trying to conquer the world's second highest peak. Looking up the Black Mountain, you can see at least 100 pinpricks of light, all in a vertical line going straight into the stars. Have you ever dreamed of reaching the top of the world? K2, the world's second highest mountain, is a climber's ultimate challenge. But unlike Everest, K2 isn't just high, it's brutal. Nicknamed the Savage Mountain, it's a place where dreams can turn into nightmares. In August 2008, a group of daring climbers set out to conquer K2. Before we dive into today's video, make sure to hit the bell icon so you don't miss any updates. We upload daily. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and join our amazing community. Now, let's get started. What started as a hopeful expedition became a disaster unlike any other. Over a single day, 11 climbers lost their lives. The worst day in K2's history. This video dives deep into the tragedy of K2's 2008 disaster. We'll explore the challenges the climbers faced, the avalanche that struck, and the stories of the brave souls who fought to survive. We'll also hear from survivors who cheated death, their voices filled with raw emotion. Was it a freak accident, or were there preventable mistakes? This documentary explores the questions that still linger around this devastating event. But this isn't just a story of death. It's a story of incredible courage, selflessness, and the unbreakable human spirit in the face of unimaginable danger. So join us as we explore the triumphs and tragedies of K2's deadliest day. K2 is the second highest mountain in the world, standing tall at 8,611 meters. It's part of the Karakoram Range, close to the Himalayas, and sits on the border between the Pakistani Gilgit Baltistan region and the Chinese occupied Tax Korgan Tajik Autonomous County of Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Climbers consider K2 to be much tougher to conquer than Mount Everest, and it's known as the third most dangerous mountain globally in terms of fatalities per summit. The most dangerous section of the climb is the Bottleneck, a steep and narrow passage overshadowed by Sirax from the ice field near the summit. The constant threat of falling ice and avalanches makes climbers want to spend as little time there as possible. Unfortunately, this section would prove to be especially deadly on this fateful day. The climbing season at K2 typically runs from June to August. However, in 2008, bad weather kept all groups from reaching the summit in June and July. By the end of July, 10 different groups were still waiting for better weather, with some waiting for nearly two months. In the months leading up to the final push for the summit, climbers focused on acclimatization and setting up camps higher on the mountain. The highest camp, Camp 4, was situated between 7,800 and 7,900 meters above sea level. As the end of July approached and the weather forecast improved, several groups gathered at Camp 4 on July 31st, preparing to attempt the summit as soon as conditions allowed. Among them were teams from the United States, France, Norway, Serbia, South Korea, along with their Sherpas from Nepal, an international team sponsored by the Dutch company Norit, and Pakistani High Altitude Porters, EHAPS. They decided to work together for the ascent on August 1st. Additionally, a few independent climbers, including a solo Spaniard and an Italian pair, also set out for the summit in the morning. Before midnight, the HAPs and Sherpas began setting up ropes for the climb. They were later joined by Alberto Zarain, a solo climber from Spain, who had climbed from Camp 3 during the night and decided to continue his push for the summit early. Unfortunately, the most experienced HAP, Shaheen Beg had to descend due to symptoms of altitude sickness. His knowledge, as the only person in the teams who had previously summited K2, and his unofficial leadership of the Haps and Sherpas, was greatly missed. Some confusion arose, and it's possible that ropes were left behind or placed incorrectly on the slope near the bottleneck. When the climbing groups began their ascent at 3 a.m., they found that the Haps and Sherpas had started setting up ropes right above Camp 4, where they weren't needed, and then ran out of rope for the traverse just above the bottleneck. This forced the climbers to use the rope from the lower part of the route, causing an unplanned and dangerous delay. Due to the high risk of reaching the summit late and the danger of falling ice in the crowded bottleneck, Eric Meyer and Frederick Strang of the American group decided to turn back to Camp 4. Chris Klinka and Jell Staleman of the Norit team also abandoned their ascent later due to various reasons, including the risk of frostbite. 
At 8 a.m., while climbing through a tough spot called the Bottleneck, Dren Mandic of the Serbian team unclipped himself from the safety rope to fix his oxygen gear and pass Cecilia Skog from Norway. Unfortunately, he lost his balance and fell, accidentally knocking into Skog. She was still secured to the rope and was knocked over but remained safe. However, Mandic fell over 100 meters down the bottleneck. Some climbers at Camp Before saw he was still moving after the fall and organized a group to help. Frederick Strang from Sweden took charge of the rescue mission. When Strang reached Mondic's body, Serbian climbers Zagarak and Planic, along with their HAP Mohammed Hussein, were already there. They found Mondic unresponsive and decided to lower his body to Camp 4, with Strang assisting. They were joined by Baig, a chap from the French team, who had completed his assisting duties and was allowed to descend. However, some later mentioned that Baig might have been suffering from altitude sickness, as his actions during the descent seemed disoriented. During the descent, Baig lost his footing and fell to his death after Strang urged him to release the rope. Strang then decided to descend without Mondic's body. The Serbian team wrapped Mondic's body in a flag, secured him to the mountain, and began their descent. Nicholas Rice from the French team also aborted the climb at this point. The delays and bottleneck traffic caused most climbers to reach the summit much later than expected, with some as late as 8 p.m., well beyond the usual summiting time of 3 to 5 p.m. Despite this, 18 people summited that day, but tragically, 8 plus 1 who stopped near the summit did not survive the lengthy descent. Among those descending, Spaniard Alberto Zerain, who had reached the summit first and alone at 3 p.m., successfully navigated through the bottleneck without incident. By 8.30 p.m., darkness covered K2. Members of the Norwegian group, including Lars Flato Nessa and Skog, who had summited two hours after Zerain, were almost through the tricky traverse leading to the bottleneck when a big chunk of ice broke off above. It sliced through all the safety lines and took Skog's husband, Rolf Bay, with it. He had stopped just 100 meters below the summit, asking Nessa to take care of his wife while he waited. Nessa and Skog had to continue down without the safety lines, but managed to make it to Camp 4 during the night. Because of the Serac's fall, descending through the bottleneck got much harder. There were big pieces of ice scattered around, and the climbers above 8,000 meters were stuck in darkness. Since they were counting on the safety lines, they didn't have extra ropes or gear for falls, so they had to climb down without any support, which is super dangerous. According to Wilco Van Ruygen from Team Norit, the climbers above the bottleneck started to panic. Some tried to climb down in the dark, while others decided to just wait until morning before trying to get down. Pemba Gyalje, a Sherpa climber who had supported others on Mount Everest before, descended in the dark without ropes to reach Camp 4 before midnight. Another Sherpa, Chiring Dorje, descended the bottleneck with little Pasang Lama strapped to his harness because Pasang was without an ice axe. Ed Viesters, in his book K2, Life and Death on the World's Most Dangerous Mountain, describes the risky descent technique. One person secures their footing and then helps the other secure theirs before moving. If Pasang had slipped, he might have taken cheering with him, which shows incredible selflessness. From the South Korean team, Kim Jae Soo and Go Mi Young also made it through the bottleneck in the dark. Go Mi Young needed assistance, so two Sherpas from the Korean B team, Cheering Bote and Big Pasang Bote, helped her. They had climbed up around midnight without food or oxygen and found Go Mi Young stuck in the bottleneck, unsure of which way to go. They guided her down safely. Meanwhile, Cass van de Gavel from Team Norit and Hugues Dobered from the French team decided to navigate the bottleneck in the dark. Van de Gavel saw a climber fall to his death as he reached the bottom of the bottleneck, a story confirmed by Sherpa's cheering boat and Big Pasang Boat, who also witnessed objects falling from the mountain. This climber was likely Dobered, whom van de Gavel had passed just above the bottleneck in the dark. Dobered had run out of bottled oxygen hours earlier, and when Van de Gevel had passed him, he seemed exhausted and urged Van de Gevel to descend first. Italian climber Marco Confortola and Norit teammates Van Royen and Ger McDonnell camped above the traverse because they couldn't find the safety ropes. During their campout, Confortola heard screams and saw headlamps vanish below him after a loud noise from the ice. At that time, eight people were still above the bottleneck. On Saturday, 2nd August, Rescue operations began at base camp, with a team sent up with ropes to aid those who still stuck in the bottleneck. Among them were Sherpas Chering Bote and Big Pasang Bote, who had assisted Go Mi Young earlier. They joined the effort to find their relative Jumik Bote and the other climbers from the Korean expedition who were still stuck above the bottleneck. In the early morning, above the traverse, Van Ruygen stopped searching for the safety ropes and descended alone. 
His eyesight was getting worse, and he was afraid of snow blindness, so he needed to get off the mountain fast. Confortola and McDonnell stayed behind. Later, Van Royegen found the remaining Korean climbers and their guide, Jumik Bahote. They were tangled in ropes, some injured and hanging there all night, but alive. It's unclear if they were caught in a second ice fall, an avalanche, or just fell and got tangled. Van Royegen couldn't do much to help and gave Jumik Bote his spare gloves. Jumik Bote said a rescue was on the way from Camp 4. Van Royen decided to keep going down. Confortola and McDonnell arrived later in the morning and worked for hours trying to free the stuck Korean climbers. It was unclear what happened next. Confortola says McDonnell suddenly climbed back up the mountain after working with him for about 1.5 hours, leaving him with the stuck men. Confortola thought McDonnell might have been affected by high altitude sickness and became delusional, thinking he had to climb back up. Left alone, Confortola did his best to help Jumik Bote, giving him his own gear and getting the Koreans into a more comfortable position, although they were still tangled in ropes. Confortola radioed Tsering Bote and Big Pasang Bote, who were on their way up to rescue the men. After spending about three hours with them, Confortola was exhausted and chose to continue down. Van Royen disagrees with Confortola's account. He saw Confortola and McDonnell helping the stuck Koreans from below and believes McDonnell didn't climb back up, but instead went up to the highest anchor to try to transfer the load. He may have then returned to help free the men further. Van Royen provides photographs in his book, Surviving K2, to support these claims. Confortola stated that shortly after he left the three men, an avalanche hit just feet away from him. In the debris, he found what he believed to be McDonnell's remains. Around noon, Tsering Podi and Big Pasang Podi arrived at the bottom of the bottleneck and found Confortola crawling. They radioed Gyalje and Van de Gevel to help Confortola while they continued searching for Jumik Pote and the Koreans. The later, Big Pasang Pote radioed Gyalje that they found Jumik Pote and two Koreans just above the bottleneck apparently freed. He also mentioned that a fourth climber wearing a red and black suit like McDonald was swept away by a Sarik fall and died. This suggests Confortola was mistaken in identifying the remains and supports Van Royen's theory that McDonnell helped free the others before being killed in a different Serac fall. Tsering Bodhi also claimed to have seen a Serac fall hit the rescue party near the top of the bottleneck. Another mystery of the 2008 K2 disaster involves the disappearance of Meherban Karim, Hap, to Hughes Dobered. Karim was last seen with Dobered in the late hours of August 1st. They likely got separated in the darkness, as only Dobered was encountered by Van de Gevel above the bottleneck. Van Royen supports the theory that Karim bivouacked even higher on the mountain. He provides photos showing a figure above the Serac field on August 2nd, which disappears in a later photo, suggesting a descent. Some, including McDonald's partner Annie Starkey, believe this figure was Kareem. Disoriented from high altitude and lack of oxygen, he may have stumbled onto the Sirac field and been swept away by an avalanche. It's possible his remains were found by Confortola earlier. Graham Bowley, in his book No Way Down 2010, finds Van Ruygen's evidence inconclusive. He and writer Michael Kodas rely more on Confortola's testimony. Photos taken by Gyalje don't clearly show individual climbers, and what appears to be trails could be natural formations on the mountain. Confortola's statements were conflicting, and many were later proven wrong. Initially, he claimed to have freed the Korean climbers, which turned out to be untrue. McDonnell had actually done so. He also may have misidentified a body as McDonnell's. Regarding the night before, Confortola said he and McDonnell saw climbers being swept away and decided to bivouac until morning, but Van Ruyen disagreed saying they all started in bivouac together. Ultimately, much of the story's accuracy relied on Van Royen's and Gyalje's versions. Confortola spoke to the media first, while Gyalje couldn't share his account until days later. There's a possibility of an error in Big Pasang Bote's observations about the color of the suit, suggesting the last climber could have been Karim, who wore a pure red suit. If true, Confortola did indeed find McDonald's remains in the avalanche earlier. Multiple plausible scenarios highlight the uncertainty, even among eyewitnesses, about the events on K2 that day. In the book Buried in the Sky, Amanda Padoan and Peter Zuckerman examine much more closely Sherpa and HAP experiences, presenting alternative scenarios and explanations, including the chance that McDonald and Kareem were still alive during the fourth Serac fall shortly after Big Pasang Pote radioed that he found his relative Jumik Pote and two Koreans, another avalanche or Serac fall hit, sweeping away all four men. Tsering Pote, who hadn't reached the top yet, survived, along with Gyalje and Confortola at the bottom of the bottleneck. The death toll now reached 11. 
Van Royen descended the mountain alone, taking a new route to the left of the Chizen route, skipping Camp Wharf 4. Van de Gevel and Gyalje descended from Camp Wharf to Camp 3rd after learning Van Royen was still up there. Van Royen made several satellite phone calls that helped locate him. He had to spend another night on the mountain, enduring severe frostbite to his feet. Van Royen is one of the few to survive two days above the 8,000 meter death zone. Van de Gevel and Gyalje found Van Royen on the Chisen route early on August 3rd, 2008. They managed to descend to the base camp by 10 guy p.m. The Pakistani military launched a rescue operation on August 4th, using helicopters to evacuate the injured Dutch climbers to Skardu. Van Royen was located thanks to GPS coordinates from his satellite phone. Confortala reached Camp 2 and was airlifted the next day. The Pakistani authorities released a list of names of those killed and injured. Additionally, four climbers, including an Italian, made their own way down the mountain and were flown to Skardu for treatment. The 2008 K2 disaster stands as a somber reminder of the immense power and unforgiving nature of mountains like K2. Sunshine and dreams turn to horror in a heartbeat. See firsthand how rising temperatures are destroying our mountains and glaciers. Join us to learn why it's urgent to act now before it's too late. The Marmalada, King of the Dolomites, a mountain paradise for hikers, hides a deadly secret. On a seemingly ordinary summer day in 2022, hikers ascended with nothing but clear skies on their minds. But then, the mountain itself cracks open. A monstrous chunk of ice, a serac, breaks free from the glacier above. In a deafening roar, ice and rock hurtle down the mountainside, swallowing everything in its path. Climbers scatter in terror, screams pierce the thin air. This is the harrowing story of the Marmalada Serac Collapse, a disaster that stole lives and left survivors forever haunted. Get ready to witness the chilling footage that will leave you breathless as we delve into the heart-wrenching tragedy that shook the world to its core. Let's unravel the harrowing events of the 2022 Marmalada Serac Collapse. Don't miss it, but be warned, it's not for the faint of heart. Towering over northern Italy like a giant crown, the Marmalada Mountains are the undisputed heavyweight of the Dolomites. Cradled between lush valleys, these peaks pierce the sky, their jagged limestone teeth glistening white against the clear blue. Nicknamed the Queen of the Dolomites, Marmalada boasts Punta Pinia, the highest peak in the entire range, reaching a staggering 3,343 meters. Hikers flock here for breathtaking views, challenging climbs, and the chance to explore a landscape sculpted by millions of years of nature's handiwork. But beneath the beauty lies a hidden danger, vast glaciers clinging to the slopes, a constant reminder of the raw power this mountain range holds. The summer of 2022 was particularly brutal. A heat wave gripped Europe, with scorching temperatures even reaching the high altitudes of the Alps. This relentless heat weakened the already stressed Marmalada Glacier. On Sunday 3rd July 2022, around 2 p.m., the unthinkable happened. A massive avalanche was triggered by a Sirac that collapsed because of high temperatures like 10 degrees Celsius the day before tragedy. This happened up high, around 2,800 meters, where a big piece of the glacier just snapped off. It was like 80 meters wide and 25 meters tall, and it was about 65,000 cubic meters big. Big chunks of ice and rock avalanche roared down the north face of the Marmalada directly onto a popular hiking trail. Many climbers and hikers were enjoying the sunny afternoon, completely unaware of the impending danger. The avalanche struck with horrifying speed, leaving no chance for escape. Rescue efforts begin as fast as possible. Rescue workers who climb mountains for a living, mountain rescue teams, and helicopters raced to where the ice and rocks landed. It was super dangerous getting there because the whole area was a mess of broken ice, chunks of rock, and the things hikers had been carrying. The more the rescuers looked, the worse it got. The news of the Marmalada disaster sent shockwaves through Italy and mountaineering community around the world. It was a wake-up call, a loud and scary reminder that things are changing in the mountains. Those giant ice slopes, the glaciers that seemed like they'd always be there, are melting faster than ever due to the global warming. This makes the mountains more dangerous and unpredictable, with loose rocks and ice more likely to break free and cause trouble. The search and rescue operation continued for days. When the collapse happened, there were about five different groups of climbers caught up in it. Sadly, 11 climbers died and eight more got hurt. Most of the people who died were from Italy, mainly from a place called Veneto. 
Two of them were from the Czech Republic. Right after the collapse, they found six bodies, and the next day they found another one. Then, three days later, they found two more, and on the fourth day, they found two more. The last person who died, they identified them using DNA testing on July 9th. It was a really sad and tough time for everyone involved. The tragedy highlighted the need for stricter safety measures in high-risk areas. It also emphasized the importance of educating climbers and hikers about the evolving risks associated with glacial landscapes. Rescue workers who bravely climbed the mountain said this wasn't your typical avalanche. They think the super hot days leading up to the disaster might be to blame. The mountain peak was way warmer than usual the day before, almost like a summer day down in the valley. On top of that, it hadn't snowed much last winter, so the giant glacier on the mountain didn't have its usual winter blanket to protect it from the hot sun. Famous climber Reinhold Messner thinks climate change is the main culprit. He says there's been a lake forming on the glacier for years, and this summer it melted again. What nobody knew is that the melted water seeped under the ice, kind of like a lubricant. A scientist named Christoph Mayer agrees, thinking the water acted like oil under the glacier, making it easier for a big chunk to break off. And later on, other scientists confirmed this theory too. The Marmalada disaster was a terrible day in the mountains. It took lives and left people forever changed. But it's also a warning sign. Our planet is getting warmer, and mountains everywhere are feeling the heat. Glaciers are melting, making these beautiful places more dangerous. We need to learn from this tragedy. Climbers need to be extra cautious, and scientists need to keep studying how climate change affects mountains. Thank you for joining us on this emotional journey. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more important stories and updates. Together, let's work towards a brighter, safer future for generations to come. Stay safe, and until next time, take care. Goodbye.